Hello, dear. My name is Dr. Gloria Bozeman Herndon. I'm the uh, CEO of GB Group Global, under which we have GB Energy, GB Pharma, GB Energy LED, and I have a couple of nonprofits that I work with, Health Care for All. Um, when it comes to my title, one of, I'm a child of God, but one of my also my title, I'm a queen in Cape Town, and in uh, I mean Cape Coast and Moray. Um, I'm Queen uh, Isowo. And I was uh, installed uh, two years ago, and I give back to that community too as well. And I'm a citizen, a native of East St. Louis, Illinois. I grew up in East St. Louis, Illinois. I was born in St. Louis though, because you know, back in the day, uh, black people were not allowed to be uh, born in hospitals except for the Catholic hospital. So a lot of uh, black people during my time were born in St. Mary's Hospital right across the bridge. My address, I was, uh, I was raised in the south end of East St. Louis, um, uh, 1509 South 20th Street, I will never forget that. And uh, we had a grocery store across from Dunbar School, it was Bozeman's Confectionery. Uh, it was a, a life of uh, one of 14 children. Uh, we had a great life, a very religious family, uh, an extended family. My mother was from Mississippi, and my father was from Arkansas and they helped to bring up to East St. Louis area, East St. Louis and Centerville, uh, other people in their family from the South, as well as they were brought up by their aunt, I mean, by their brothers and sisters. So that was that migration from the South into the Midwest. Some of our people also went to Chicago and then into Detroit, and some even up to Buffalo, New York. It was a community and you grew you had your responsibilities, you handled your responsibilities. And even with 14 children, we grew up with more than that. Because my aunt, some of her children lived with us. Then there were other families who came and lived in our basement and they, and they stayed maybe three or four years. And after that, they would move into their own respective homes. People gave and they shared. And uh, so it was, you had to learn how to be disciplined and you managed and compartmentalized your properties and you didn't interfere and step over up a boundaries with other people. And that's something people should learn how to do now when you're dealing with people socially, politically, economically. And, uh, and that was what it was like. We were all public school except for the last uh, child. And she went to this Mary Institute private schools. You know, at that stage, our parents uh, uh, had funds enough to make sure that she had uh, that private education. But even our public school education was quite good because we were not just educated in uh, our schools, we were educated in our homes, we were educated in our churches, we were educated in our organizations. Uh, I was a musician too, and I played for our church. Uh, I was in Sunday school, you know, we taught Sunday school. We were all in all, look, we stayed in church on Sunday, we were in church from morning to night. And uh, during the week we were in church uh, many, many days, and we went to uh, Bible school, Bible study, and we, uh, of course, went to our music classes. I was a Girl Scout, Campfire Girl. We, we, we were busy. That's why we didn't get into any trouble, because we were so busy. There were so many. Um, there were, there was my piano teacher, Mrs. Rush, and then there was Margie Olive, I'm sure you all know. And as well, there were uh, my Girl Scout leader, Mrs. Ward. Uh, then there were a lot of senior citizens in the community and since we had the grocery store people would come into the store and they would see us, they knew us and we, uh, we gave credit for people who needed things and uh, people were appreciative of that and we gave back into the community. My parents made sure that we did that. So, and then of course there were my teachers, Mrs. Glenn who I remember from the third grade and uh, some of the other teachers that we had. And then when I was going to graduate school, there was a gentleman who took a liking to me. And uh, I finished uh, undergraduate school when I, I, I started graduate school when I was 19 at Johns Hopkins. And I did so well in school that he said, you know, you really, I told him I wanted to go into international affairs. He said, you should go to my school. His name was Bill Feeney. And I was young and I did very well. And I uh, passed the test to go into Johns Hopkins School for Advanced International Studies and I went into the master's and PhD program in 19. Finished all my work toward my PhD 
in two and a half years. And uh, then I went to work for Brookings, I worked at Brookings Institute, which is an incredible think tank, while I was in, uh, while I was in uh, college. And I worked for the Carnegie Endowment and Council of Foreign Relations. I played piano for the churches. I played piano for the Masons and the Eastern Star. I worked in the retail at Saks Fifth Avenue. <laughs> so I had, I was busy. And uh, during all that time, I, after finishing school, I hadn't finished my, my uh, dissertation. I had finished my master's and my PhD work, and I hadn't done my dissertation because I was so busy with getting on with my career. So I uh, worked for the African American Institute for like three months. Then I went into the Foreign Agricultural Service for a year, and I wanted to go in the State Department. So I went in Foreign Agriculture, got everything, all my clearances done, so I could go into the State Department. I went into the State Department, did all my studies there, and went through, matriculated, and then I got my assignment into Nigeria. And I had to finish my dissertation. I had a, a, a limited time to finish it. So I had a mentor called uh, Thomas Pickering, Ambassador Pickering. And he told me, Gloria, what you need to do is go and uh, finish your dissertation. And so I went to Zaria in the northern part of Nigeria at the Akmado Bello University. And there I uh, taught economics and I finished my dissertation. And then I went and opened up the economic uh, department in Kaduna, which was the northern part of Nigeria. I was 20, 26, 27. You know what? I never ordered my steps. He ordered my steps. So when I first met my husband, uh, it was in 1969, I, was, uh, I had gone to Ghana, and he was in Ghana, but he, I didn't like him then. I mean, I had met him before, but I hadn't seen him as a, as a man, you know. And uh, he was sort of cute. But I won Soul Sister number one. I played the piano and sang and danced, and uh, he was looking at me real funny. And I said, no, I'm not having this. And later I met him. Uh, he came back in 1974, and we went to uh, Zaire, the Rumble in the Jungle. And so that was when Muhammad, uh, Muhammad Ali and George Foreman were fighting. And Brent was there. He was a beautiful, tall, nice-looking man. And Muhammad Ali was bragging about how fine he was. But my husband knew he was finer, okay? So <laughs> they couldn't tell the difference between uh, these two light-skinned black men. So we walked down the streets of Zaire in Kinshasa, and they would be throwing money at my husband. And Brent told me, take the basket and just keep the money. He wasn't my husband then. Keep, keep the money. Okay, I took the basket and kept the money. And then I, there were a lot of poor people in the village, I mean, in the market. And he had collected all this money because they thought he was Muhammad Ali. So I went and took the money and just gave it to a woman with a baby. He said, you giving my money away. I said, don't worry. You're going to benefit from me giving this money away. And so in 1976, we got married. That was a time when you, sex was made for marriage. <laughs> you know, you didn't jump into uh, those kind of relationships. And so my husband and I developed. We used to, uh, when, when in 75, when we were in Nigeria, and he would come to see me, because we, we was doing business, and I was the economic counselor in the embassy. I was the first black female economic counselor in the embassy of Lagos. And that was right also before FESTAC. And so I was the only black there. So although I'm an economist, they said, look, you'd be in charge of FESTAC because all these black people are coming and nobody else wanted to do it. OK. But I got to meet Stevie Wonder, Cool and the gang, all the brothers, all the sisters uh, from all over the world. And uh, he and I became very close friends then. That was right before our marriage. And uh, one of the interesting things is we went to Badagery to the slave markets, and we experienced all that together. We went to uh, the northern part of Nigeria, where the Muslims were, and we experienced all that. We went to the east, uh, where the, uh, the, the massacre of the Igbo people was. And in fact, in 1969, I went there to Asaba, where they had massacred all of these. They, they brought all the women and children out, and they told them the war had ended. But the war had not completely ended, and they killed all those people. There was the massacre of Asaba 
You can look it up. And uh, when I got into the embassy, in seven, after seeing all that, and to see how the Igbos had been treated, I got into the embassy in 75, and as an economist, I wanted to make sure that I de de demonstrated parity above, um, among all of the uh, tribes. So although the Igbos had been persecuted so, and I'm so shocked now to have lived to 2023 and to have seen people who were so skinny, were kwashiokor, the mouths white and all that, who have grown up to be our number one uh, female basketball players in America are Igbos. Some of our number one NFL players are Igbos. So we have incredible, but you see the change that has come, the wonderful change that has come. So uh, that was part of my experience there. I took a chance on life. Who would have thought a girl from East St. Louis would have gotten on a plane in 1969 and flew into uh, Cape Verde, then went into Ghana by herself, went into, and I was doing a, a book, Talk Baby Option, then went into Benin, or by road, uh, Togo, by road, and then into Nigeria. A girl all by herself, and all I did was send my mother and father a life insurance policy. And my mother said, this child is going to die, but I came back to live again. So uh, it was, it was, and it's all been good because I've lost a lot, but I've gotten a lot. And I've gained a lot of experience that I can glean and help so many people with. And I have impacted a lot of lives. I, I, I went out and I had an incredible career and I made quite a bit of money. Uh, most of the money I made initially was uh, when my husband and I had this borehole drilling company in Nigeria. And we represented Ingersoll Rand and Jacuzzi Pumps and uh, Johnson Control. So we were doing the boreholes. A lot of places people didn't have water. So we would bore the boreholes and we would see how the community would change from the boreholes. So we had about a thousand employees. We had like four uh, big drill rigs and we were boring, and we were so, and we, those boreholes would uh, uh, create a lot of cash flow back then. We, we, we had contracts with Coca-Cola. We would do all the water for Coca-Cola, for Delta Steel, so many, and for all the military. So we had a lot of big contracts. And uh, then we, I said, Brent, we need to bring some money back into the U.S. So we said, one, I said, one of the places we're going to do it, I said, now you are from, you, my husband was born on a Choctaw reservation in Broken Bow, Oklahoma. And the, during that time, really, the Native Americans started growing in terms of the casinos and the impact, okay? So he didn't have to bring much money to where he, he was. But then he had lived also after that in Los Angeles. So he was the head of the Chamber of Commerce, Los Angeles Chamber of Commerce, when uh, Bill Bradley, Tom, Tom Bradley was the mayor. And his, uh, uh, the co his person who was under him was a gentleman called Col Comer Cottrell. Comer Cottrell was the president of Proline Products. So my husband had been an entrepreneur. He was also the head of Sears. It was Sears and Roebuck back then. He was the top black person in Sears back then. So we decided to do that business in Africa. And we made a lot. Of, so we brought the money back into the U.S. And we decided to put a lot into real estate. For me, that was a, it, it was difficult because we had too much huma humanity in our, uh, our approach. We went and bought all this land down in Sh Shreveport, Louisiana to change that community. We bought all this land in East St. Louis to help change that community. We bought land up in Peoria, Illinois to help change and modify that community. We bought uh, uh, property in South St. Louis to help change that community. But you know, when you buy property, it's worse than a child. Because at 18, the child leaves you. You're going to be paying taxes on that property the rest of his life, forever. And, it, and sometimes it appreciates, but just remember also, it requires a lot of maintenance. It was like a labor of love. We were giving back into the community. But I've done a whole lot of other things that I really feel good about, and particularly helping the girl child with the High Tea Society, George Blonder Foundation, and then giving back to our historically black colleges and universities. I'm the chair of the corporate board now, and I have been for many years, and I've made sure I've put together a program called 
the NAFIO, which is the National Association for Equal Opportunity in Higher Education, the NAFIO Student Loan Program, where we put, it, put together a pool of money where all these kids who were getting these student loans could uh, take the, at the end of their schooling, we had enough put aside for them that they could pay their first six months in re to return their money for the loans and some up to a year and that way they wouldn't default on their loans and they wouldn't and we taught them how to manage their credit and all that kind of stuff. So, and then we had the NAFIO student insurance program which I was, uh, was the organizer of and now what we did with that program we did a lot of preventive care, we did a lot of wellness care, we did a lot of holistic care and then we would go into those uh, those uh, uh, cafeterias and that and and make them be accountable for what they were feeding our children. And then we would also make sure that kids would understand. You know, I'm a proponent of not putting all that uh, that natural un unnatural stuff in your hair. What do they call that stuff? Where you the straightener, the perms. Yeah. And now you see, people are dying from uterine cancer from those perms. So, and I think what God gives you is for you. God did not mean for me to be a skinny, small-lipped, small-foot woman. Now I'm a big-foot woman with big lips and large body, and now I'm in, you know, back in the day I wasn't in vogue, but everybody wants my lips now, baby. <laughs> you know what, I believe, first of all, you have to have a moral compass. Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. Do not hurt. I see these kids now bullying each other. I see people who are taking the short stick, the short way out of things. You have to practice. This is why I've done well on the piano. I practice. I read. And you've got to focus on things that are important. Uh, and then as you come through this life, you have to help somebody. The helping people helps you, you know. Uh, some people don't have it as easy as, as you have, and they have different kind of constraints. I've had a lot of my friends who've died and who have suffered, and I've been there with them. And in fact, I just had a sister to die, and I was there with her, and she told me at the end of her life, she said, Baby, I love you. I'm not dying. I'm just fading away. And she just faded away. But I wanted to give you another experience that I had to demonstrate how God can bring you through and he will never leave you. Uh, in 1980, I was a little too old to be pregnant, but I was pregnant. And I went to uh, uh, the doctor and he says, you've had a miscarriage, so I'm gonna give you a DNC. Now, I was at the embassy at, at that time, uh, the, uh, up in Kaduna, the consulate. And you know, they didn't have water and all that kind of stuff. And it was very difficult. So uh, my husband was afraid to leave me at home by myself. He was going to do some boreholes up in the northern part of uh, Kaduna and uh, in a place called Daura. Uh, and uh, it was way up into the, in the uh, desert. And I was feeling, you know, sick and drawn and all. And my stomach was hurting, but uh, it was only to be expected because I had a, a DNC because I thought I had a, a, a miscarriage. And uh, I was faint. So as I, as he was, we had a driver. He was driving us, and I was feeling, I said, Brent, I'm feeling real faint. So he stopped, we stopped at a hotel, and we stayed there. And that night, well, the next morning, in fact, I passed out. So they didn't have an ambulance, but they had the water, uh, the water uh, board truck. And they put me in the back of the truck and took me to a hospital in a place called Katsina. When I was in that hospital, it was terrible. There were no beds. It was, and so my husband went to the water well, water board to get beds and get a generator. The toilet didn't have a toilet seat on it. There was no water. And uh, there was a Filipino doctor there who had, who was a, a doctor at Johns Hopkins who was there in the northern part of Nigeria doing research and, and correcting these girls who had multilups. Multilups is like when you get a nine-year-old girl or a 12-year-old girl who marries these al Hajis, these older men, and they split them from front to back. Those girls then become like the beggars and worthless. So that they, his, he was reconstructing them, okay? So that night he told my husband, because I'm an American and, and I'm at the embassy, and my husband's a big businessman, he said, she's not going to live tomorrow. And so uh, he said, my husband said, what, what's happened? 
and my stomach was distending. And he said, she has an ectopic pregnancy and her tube is burst. We have to take her to the theater now. They took me into the theater. They tied me down. They, uh, uh, my husband went to the uh, water well uh, board to get a generator. They got a generator, but they still had no water. And they tied me and they had no anesthesia. And that was in 1980, you know, that was right around the HIV AIDS time. My husband and I luckily had the same blood type. They took blood from him and put it into me. They cut me open with no anesthesia. There were four levels of skin open. They took all the congealed blood out and then they sewed me back up, okay? They took so much blood from my husband that he passed out. But now remember, we're in a hospital with no water and so the water well people brought these buckets of water and all. And then we had, uh, fortunately, housekeepers and, and people who work for us. So the hospitals there didn't feed you. So my people came and brought food. So I was in that hospital for 38 days, okay? During that 38 days, I was able to t hold every one of those girls' hands as they had surgery, because they too were being uh, operated on with no anesthesia and I was able to recover to a level. On the 39th day, they got me out and took me to a place called Kaduna, where I was living. When I went to Kaduna, I unfortunately caught malaria. And I had cerebral malaria, which usually kills you. They gave me the last rites. Now, 12 people from the U.S. had come over to see me because I had been sick for so long. And I was in such bad shape. I lost about 48 pounds and and when those people came to me, I, there was no Baptist uh, priest or minister there. So they brought an Anglican priest in, and he gave me the last rites. So my husband was on my side, and my friends were in the room. And that morning, I got up and had some orange juice. And I've been gone ever since then. That was 1980. But of all those 12 people, including my husband, I have been there too speak at all of their funerals, and I say to all of them, thank you and well done. Yeah, well, you know, when I was in college, I was in the Black Student Union, and you know, that was the time when, you know, it was all about black pride, and it was all about Africa, and we saw the persecutions of so many uh, people, and I was a dear friend of, um, of Mamie Till, um, and, uh, and as part of my activism, especially in living in Nigeria, and about Africanism and Pan-Africanism, uh, I was all about that. And all about uh, the atrocities that have been committed upon so many people all over the world. And I've always been a drum major for the underserved. And I worked really hard in the prisons to make sure and people who have, they take their rights from them and, and, and incarcerate you. And you have no rights, you have no, uh, you, they absolutely use us as well as people in the military who they do the very same thing with. But uh, I've always been a drum major for the underserved. You know what, I don't talk to monkeys in trees, okay? Look, if you're ignorant, <laughs> don't come this way. I, I had finished Johns Hopkins and I was one of the best in my class. In fact, I was president of my class. And I went into a, uh, a job at Department of Agriculture. And this white woman came up to me and says, now, because, you know, of where your background is, you're going to have to take remedial English. I said, excuse me. Now, because of what your background is, I'm not going to take offense to that. Because, obviously, you're ignorant. If I could do, be the best in my class at Johns Hopkins, could be a research assistant in a think tank, and again, could be uh, uh, in my church supporting and providing uh, the community service, certainly I do not need to take remedial English. What I do need to do is come and help and train and be a therapist for you people who don't understand where I come from. So I always knew myself. I mean, I was always comfortable in myself. I was in uh, countries and I would I'd be there doing coup d'etats. You know what coups are? When the whole government would be overthrown. Well, okay, what, what Trump and them tried to do recently, a coup, okay. So yeah, I would be in countries, people would lose everything they have in a second, okay? I have seen people lie on the floor in hospitals and die 
just having the baby, okay? I have seen uh, people fall in, being thrown into the ocean and killed, okay? I have seen some of my best friends executed for no reason. Look, life is not, you didn't come here to stay. So I just want to leave an imprint while I'm here. And uh, I've had so many good people too, and I have to give credit to my cousin Maya Angelou. Maya was my heart, my love, and the source of a lot of my dreams. Two days before she died, she told me to come down to Winston-Salem. I was on my way to Burkina Faso, and I said, Maya, no, I'm going to go to Burkina Faso, and I'm going to come back and see you when I, when I come back. She says, no, cousin, you come here now. And she wait, I called the driver, and he came and picked me up, and my little sister was here with me, so we both went down to Winston-Salem to see Maya. Maya was sitting in the living room, I picked, have pictures of her, just sitting there waiting for us. And she had breakfast, like a brunch ready for us, and we had some mimosa, and then she, we just ate through the day. And then she said, now I want you to do something. I want you, now we had the, I had the Escalade, and it had a, a, the thing where you put a boat on it. We went and got the U-Haul and put on it. She gave me some stuff, she said, I want you to take this. And it was a lot of stuff. So I took it, and she said, now you take this and you keep this. And uh, I took it. And I got back to Washington, and then I went and caught my flight that evening to go to Burkina Faso. Uh, I had to go through Air France into Paris, and I flew from Paris into Ouagadougou. And as I got into Ouagadougou, the president knew, uh, knew I was coming. He had heard that Do Dr. Angelo had died, and he knew that she was my cousin. And so she, he, they brought me into the VIP lounge, and there was this big screen, and there was a picture of Maya, and it said she was dead. Now, I was really, I was caught by surprise because, you know what, she knew she was leaving. And I was just thankful to God because I have definitely been anointed to know that one of the last things she did was want to see me, and she wanted me to get these things that I have kept all this time. And she died about nine years ago. So she was definitely a person who left uh, a tremendous impact on me, as she has Oprah Winfrey and so many other people, Betty Shabazz, Toni Morrison. I met all those people with, uh, with Dr. Angelou. And she was uh, everybody's mother, she was everybody's friend, and she was not only Maya Angelou, she was everybody's angel. You know what, some of the most incredible people in the world come from East St. Louis and still are in East St. Louis. And um, in a way, that city was doomed by external people too. Why would you have a city that doesn't benefit from its own tax structure? You pay for the money for the taxes in Belleville. Why do you have a city that you have uh, one of the worst chemical plants in the, in the world right next door to it and uh, people are dying from cancer because they are ingesting these poisons. Why do you have a city that, uh, although you have the most uh, gifted people in the world, they're stymied by bad school systems and people who really don't care about them? Okay, but look at the positive part. We had the most beautiful churches, and uh, I had mothers all over the church. And, you know, I love the fact that they were equal opportunity abusers. They used to beat all of us. And if one person did something, my brother used to take these little plastic uh, uh, lizards and things and throw them into the motherboard, and all of the kids would get a beating. You know, so they wanted to make sure that if you didn't get it because you did it, you get it because he did it, and they're going to share the wealth, whether it was a beating or not. But also, we, there was so much teaching. You were taught. And then, let me tell you something. You got a lot of exercise, because back in the day when I came up, I think I walked at least 20 miles a day, and not quite 20, but they, we didn't have a car. We, we had cars, we had, but the cars were only for grown people. So you got 14 kids, you ain't getting in no car. You got to walk. And we lived in South End, so we used to walk across where that railroad, that, uh, uh, what's the name of the railroad track? The railroad track, to get to our church, which was in Centerville, which they used to call Firework Station. So we would take a stick, because you know that land where the, well, where the railroad was, was always the worst land, and there used to be quicksand over there. So we would take the stick, and we would never go by ourselves, because if you got stuck in the, in the quicksand, you know you ain't coming out. 
So things like that you never thought, people would never think that that kind of stuff happened. And, uh, but that was, what, that's, that was the kind of thing, that was the wild, wild west for us. That was our wild, wild west. I hope for East St. Louis that it becomes a more um, cosmopolitan, a more, and I love the things that you all are doing in terms of a, that you have a, are looking at having a global seat and that you're teaching children how to become entrepreneurs. You're not going to make money or you're not, you're not going to contribute if you don't do something on your own. And so I'm going to tell you, don't be afraid of being an entrepreneur. I have made so much money and I have lost so much money. But my husband told said it right. You, the, the more money you make, the, it may feel good, but the best love you make is when you broke. Although I told him, I don't mind, I, I think I'd rather, rather have some money than make some love and be broke, okay? But anyway, it's all right. <laughs> so, so I said, yeah, so this is why all these people having these kids are broke, because <laughs> they make get love, because they're broke, but anyway. But, uh, you know, I, uh, it's just been great experiences, and, uh, and it's been a great opportunity. And, you know, now I'm, I'm, I'm transitioning, too, to my, my Neverland, because I, I was told, my husband told me, he, he first went to hell when he left here, and, uh, and the devil got mad at him, and he won the lottery and went to heaven. He said, yeah, I got to go to heaven because my wife is coming. So I got to be here. So he, uh, at nighttime, he you know, sometimes said, Gloria, you better hurry up because I'm going back to hell. Ain't no fun up here in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me just tell you one thing. Don't ever be afraid of taking a chance. When my husband and I bought all this land in D.C., man, black man, black woman, they tried so much. And you know, this man's big old tall, and here I am. And everything we tried, they put a stumbling block in our way. We had, uh, I, I was on the board of the bank that we got a little bit of money from. The bank went under and the other people came in and said, okay, give us your money, give us the land, give it. Okay, Every, everything we, they could to do to break up our marriage, but it didn't work. And then we, we stood steadfast. Okay, one challenge goes and another one comes. But you know what? You just stand. Don't worry about it. You know, when, when we lost all that money in, in Nigeria during that coup, we lost some money. Some people were jumping out of windows and all. I'm not jumping out of a window because of a house and a piece of jewelry. No. I'm going to get right back up and I'm going to make more. And if you just have faith in God and a love from your person, with the person you're with and the people you, that you're with, and you help, your currency is going to be helping people. You know, I have made so many people rich, and I've made so many people, I've helped so many people with their education. I've always told them, get your education, and then you can just build on that, okay? And then also be compassionate. You know, I, I just, I was telling you about this gentleman, Tommy Dorch. He died two days ago. Pancreatic cancer, uh, just as Dr. Uh, Calvin B B uh, Butts. You know, the stuff, people, you know, you're not going to be here forever. But while you're here, be charitable, be loving, be understanding, and God will take care of you. One thing you got to have is good governance. Uh, you got to have people who are not about themselves in government. You got to have people who are about the community in government. Then you got to have a strategy. You just can't be haphazard. This thing, this place, this, that place, no. Come up with a plan of action. Give yourself a time of to do this, that, and this and that. You know, you have to be organized, okay? And then you have to uh, glean what is needed from other people, from, from people. And train, you gotta train the, other, the, the young people. And then you gotta give young people a chance. You, you, you can't be controlling everything. You know, like right now, the president of, uh, of uh, Cameroon is 90 years old. The man was just here for the conference and I don't care what anybody said, they told the man to get up and speak, and he said, where am I? Who am I going to speak to? Boy, you got Alzheimer's. You don't know who you, where you are. You know, step over, step out, and let somebody else come in. You know what I mean? When I was young, I could dance, okay? Really, I used to dance even with Catherine Dunham. I, but you know what? I'm old. I ain't fooling nobody. These knees do not work like they used to. I got neuropathy, my feet hurt, and everything else. And so, look, there's a time, there's a season for everything. 
this is a season for me to mentor, to help, to encourage, and to let the other young people go and do it for, this, for them to do. And on top of that, I wish I could tell this to my uh, granddaughter, my, my grand, great grandson's mother, and if she sees this, I want her to know, no, you're not bringing that little three-year-old boy here for me to take care of, although I love you to death. Ha, 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 ha.